Um, again, I'm Margot Mooring, and um, I wanted to thank you very much for inviting me. As an urban planner, um, I can tell you what a joy it is to work with attorneys who care about the environment and get this stuff. Um, so keep doing what you're doing, and know that you've made an urban planner very happy. So I'm sure you're going to sleep a lot better tonight. But I wanted to start with that. Um, I do wear two hats, um, as was alluded to. I am the policy director at the Northeast Florida Regional Council. This is a map of um, regional councils in Florida. We are creatures of the state. We have some uh, mandated responsibilities, mostly review type things, not regulatory type things. And mostly what we do is convene. So if an issue is regional, the place to come is the regional council to start talking about it. In the case of, of Northeast Florida, we have a policy think tank, um, which is a nonprofit organization that was created by the Regional Council to fulfill that role, to have a little bit of distance and independence from the Regional Council and to do work, um, policy work. And it's, it's done by volunteers. Now, I'm paid by the Regional Council. They pay my salary. Um, but I'm assigned as executive director to this nonprofit. Um, so, and this nonprofit doesn't, it has funding when it's able to fundraise, but otherwise it is supported by me. But it is largely um, supported by volunteers. And actually, I see some of the volunteers um, in this room, um, and there's quite a few of them. Um, there's a regional leadership academy in Northeast Florida. Um, once you graduate from the regional leadership um, academy, you become a member of the Regional Community Institute, and then you're mine. I can abuse you for the rest of your days and try to get you to volunteer on policy issues that are in of interest to you. Um, and as was stated, we do different. We do a different policy um, assignment each um, each year. Um, active members of the Regional Council Board of Directors are also members of the Regional Community Institute. So the first task this nonprofit took on was, as mentioned, um, the 50-year um, vision for growth and development in Northeast Florida. The reason we did that is because we had a outdated, um, let's call it not very robust regional plan that we thought would benefit by having um, a vision um, that people really thought through for what we wanted to be when we, we grew up. We did a 50-year planning time frame um, and created First Coast Vision. We then used that to um, update the plan. Um, but it had an action item in it, and I'll read it. Um, bring together leadership and experts from the region to determine climate change impact and have indicated mitigation and adaptation plans. And I can tell you there was a discussion about whether we should even say climate and change in the same sentence. Uh, because we are in Northeast Florida, and it is not a dialogue that we were actively having in um, 2010 when this stuff was happening. Um, so here is the... Um, the motion that the Regional Council made asking the Regional Community Institute, again the nonprofit, um, to consider specifically sea level rise. They reached out for a six month period and said, tell us what you think about climate change. Tell us anything you think about climate change, anything you want to share. What came in was mostly sea level rise. So that's why they started with sea level rise. Um, they wanted to consider sea level rise as potential to impact Northeast Florida. They made no assumptions that it was going to happen simply if there's potential. So if, if, the, um, if the Institute determines our region is vulnerable, we ask them to determine working assumptions for level of rise and planning time frame, to assist local governments in assessing their resiliency, and to recommend regional strategies if they believe it appropriate. And it's not like they gave them funding, they gave them me. Um, and we used volunteers. So it was, it was a, lot to, um, a lot to ask. Um, as I said, sea level rise was the thing that, um, when asked about climate change, um, input came in. It was about, um, it was about sea level rise. Um, we use this approach because we're not South Florida, um, both from the perspective of we're not seeing sea level rise as regularly as um, people are experience for, experiencing, for example, flooding in South Florida. It's a little bit more in your face if you're in the Keys or you're in Miami. Um, and the other thing is that we didn't have money. South Florida had been working on sea level rise for years for those reasons um, and had been successful at getting grants and getting help. Um, we were doing it on a shoestring. As I said, our, dia our dialogue was just beginning. There was also some fortuitous timing because there is a funded, e funded effort in our region that's looking at natural resources in Matanzas Bay. Um, and so if we could work with them, 
um, make sure that we were aligning the work that they were doing, and they're doing it's three year um, process, and they're actually doing modeling of Matanzas Bay. It's really good data, um, and if we can keep that, you know, sort of going in the same direction, that's a huge opportunity. Um, the another reason we chose this approach is that we were sort of sensing a dearth of national and state direction and leadership, and this is something we could control. We didn't need to wait for the state to tell us how to do it. Um, we talked to insurance companies, and one of the messages that we got is, despite the fact that insurance companies, and I mean private insurance companies, um, are looking at risk mitigation and they're considering wind, let's say, more than they're considering flood, certainly these things are related, and failure to plan is something that insurance companies are paying attention to. Um, as you probably know, the Bigger Waters Act is trying to fix the National Flood Insurance Program, trying to make it pay for itself where it hasn't been sustainable for many years. So that is an issue that's bringing up um, lots of things to do with the coastline. Um, the FEMA Community Rating System was um, changed in, it, it, it finished, the, the new guidebook came out in 2013, and there's additional benefit to communities for planning, for doing this kind of planning. Um, and doing this kind of getting the word out to folks. Um, assessing and addressing coastal and waterfront resiliency can save money, and I say coastal and waterfront because we're talking about both the river, um, and because our river is, um, does impact um, sea level rise, um, and those thing, doing those things can save money, and the same actions that a community takes to address sea level rise can, can address flooding and extreme weather events, so you get more bang for your buck. Um, so here are the steps that the Regional Community Institute took. Um, the first question was determine if we were vulnerable. Um, if so, assumptions for level of rise and time frame. Um, they did community resiliency assessments of interested coastal and waterfront communities, perfect, completely voluntary. If, if communities' hands went up that they wanted to do it, we did it with them. Um, they were to use what was learned to provide policy recommendations to the Regional Council Board, which they did in October 2013. Um, the board approved their work in November 2013, and there is now a regional action plan, and actually Tom alluded to it. Um, it's available at their website under their committee page. Um, these are some slides that I'd like to thank the Army Corps of Engineers for. Um, and this is really the data that the Regional Community Institute used. Uh, we didn't do any modeling. We didn't have money for that. We were using existing data to make our assumptions. So we looked at um, tidal gauge history. So um, over the, the past um, years, it's an average of about 2.3 millimeters a year. Um, that's that kind of straight, almost straight line. Um, that's what sea level rise has been. Um, this is a depiction of anticipated acceleration of sea level rise. This is the table that kind of lays out what um, the committee, it was the Emergency Preparedness Committee of the Regional Community Institute, what they looked at. They looked at, they decided to look in 50 year in increments. So they looked at 2060 and they looked at 2110. The dates became not that important, but I'll, I'll explain the extent to which they did become important. Um, and, and they decided to look at the US Army Corps assumptions. So low, intermediate, high, and um, high were the ranges that they looked at. So I'll come back to that. This is, um, so this is all in, answer, in, in asking the question, are we vulnerable? Again, these are just the three um, scenarios that they looked at. So they came to the conclusion, yes, we are vulnerable. They decided to look at um, if they'd gone just by the U.S. Army Corps assumptions, they would have looked at one to two feet by 2060. They decided to look at one to three feet by 2060 in order to match with the Matanzas Basin work that's being done. Three foot is um, the level at which you begin to see significant impacts based on the modeling done in Matanzas Basin. So they took a more conservative assumption or a more whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, they, they decided one to three foot by 2060, three to six foot by 2110. Uh, the six foot probability may be low, worst case, you know, I, we always say that. Um, they use the most simple NOAA coverage. So the source was NOAA and it's what NOAA would call a bathtub model. It looked only at elevation. It's not the most robust way to do it, um, but it is the simplest way to do it. Um, and the purpose was to start the conversation. Um, 
their, their next step was to make the offer to communities that were coastal or on the river um, to see if they would do community resiliency assessments and then to get from that um, policies for consideration. Ultimately, they did a committee compilation of 40 pages or more that, uh, that sort of documents everything that they talked about and then the regional action plan. Um, and this kind of brings me to the time frames because this is why the time, this is the only way that the time frames really came in is um, the communities decided what community assets they wanted to look at. Um, public infrastructure was a lot of the assets that they looked at and so the, the lifespan of that infrastructure was relevant. So I'm just going to zoom you through. <coughs> These are maps that were created if we looked at the entire region and regional resources, and this, this, these maps have the largest employer in each of the seven county regions. Um, <coughs> things like Mayport um, and Georgia Pacific in, um, in Putnam County are, are very impacted by, um, at least by six feet of rise. They looked at historic districts and national monuments, and in the case of national monuments, um, we have to be concerned about Fort Caroline, about Castillo de San Marco, about Fort Matanzas. They looked at transportation, and this one is on here because the port really needs to be thinking about this. Um, and Tom talked a little bit about this, um, basically the actions that they recommended, and um, it's, a, it's a, a nine page document, it is not a massive document. Um, create a clearinghouse on understanding risks, and that doesn't mean create new things, just get come up with an easy way to get tools together for individuals and local governments who are trying to figure out what to do about sea level rise. Engage the community, um, and I put a couple um, bullet points at the end because um, we have our fingers crossed. We're trying to do something we're, we call dipping our toes in rising waters at one spark. Um, we don't have a venue yet, so I'm a nervous wreck. But keep your fingers crossed for me. Um, and we'll be doing educational meetings in all seven counties. Um, saving money is a thing that um, resonates with people, so helping communities participate in the community rating system is really important. Um, even more important now that Bigger Waters is changing the rules for flood insurance. Um, and also working with a NOAA methodology called What Will Adaptation Cost? You need to, it's a really robust methodology that gives you cost benefit analysis for your local government, but you need local assumptions from economists, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's work that's going to be done. Um, there's a lot going on in the region that gives us um, data that's specific to us, so taking that to account, into account is important. Um, and they, they propose to create this committee called the um, Public-Private Regional Resiliency Committee, P2R2, led by the private sector with the goal of determining a regional strategy that will incentivize population and private development to locate outside of vulnerable areas. So tall order, but do it with the private sector leadership and it could happen in Northeast Florida. And why is this good business? Um, we think there's going to be migra migration from South Florida. Where are those people going to go? It might be here. We have undeveloped high ground. Um, our coastal communities showed us that they've been thinking about the flood proneness of um, areas before they locate infrastructure. So they've been mindful of this um, to date. So they're still attractive. In general, we're not afraid of what we understand. Um, we think that we should also be looking at the next step in water. So there's water supply planning. You heard a lot about it earlier today. Um, but that doesn't answer what we will do. It answers what might happen and what our alternatives are. Um, and we're suggesting if you're doing long-term planning like this and you're trying to show businesses that you are responsible and resilient, um, the water question is also in there. Um, we expect that businesses want information before they invest in a region, so we want to be able to give it to them. We want the Chamber of Commerce to willingly tell um, businesses what, what's likely to happen, what the alternatives are, and we think homeowners will come to the point where they'll want to know as well before they invest. Um, adaptation can address flooding now, sea level rise later, because there's going to be a catastrophic event, and we need a plan for what we're going to do at that point. Um, so if we start now, we can incentivize movement from vulnerable areas. If we start later, we're not going to have those options. And our market strategy for the region could be that we are ready. And with that, this is how to reach me if you need to. Thanks a lot. Next is Sarah gonzalez rothy Cronenbaugh.
I have a Mac, so I don't know. Slide show. Uh, slide show. There we go. Okay, hi guys. My name is Sarah Gonzalez Ruffy Cronenthal. Buckle your seatbelts. I have three last names and I'm half Cuban, so I talk fast. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about the critters today, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change, but primarily about how do we avoid critter conflicts between economic development and wildlife. And the reason that I'm going to focus on that is we haven't done a good job doing that even when we aren't planning for climate change. So we need to focus on that certainly all the more in light of the fact that we are in in a changing climate. Talk about sea level rise, think about ocean acidification, more frequent and more intense coastal storms. All of these things will make planning for wildlife that much more important. Okay, so potential Florida conflicts that you've got between economic development and wildlife. I've got some federally imperiled species up here. You've got the endangered Florida panther. There are about 100 to 160 of these guys left. They're the most endangered mammal species in the eastern United States. I've got the Florida manatee. There are about 4,800 of these guys left, and every year we have 99 human-related deaths of, of the Florida manatee. I've got the pipe, piping plover. Um, the population that you guys see down here from October to about this time every year is threatened, but there is a uh, population of piping plover that goes to the Great Lakes region every uh, summer. They migrate and nest up there, and they are actually federally endangered. And then I've got the North Atlantic right whale. There are about 400 adults of these guys, and the top threats to them are entanglement with fishing gear and collisions. These guys winter and calve off the southeast region. Um, this is going to be one of the questions while you're working on port expansion, uh, offshore energy. When I was in Senator Nelson's office, I would, had folks come in and propose that we put wind energy off of the coast of northeast Florida. And calving grounds for endangered North Atlantic right whales don't really do that well when you've got other things going on out there. Um, so these are not new conflicts. If you look at the case of the piping plover and, and the Florida panther, the beginning of the imperilment of these two goes all the way back to the 1800s. So the Florida panther was actually um, hunted because you've got a large predator species back in the 1800s. Now their biggest conflict is habitat destruction and habitat fragmentation. And with the piping plover in the 1800s, these guys were used for the millinery trade. So feather hats. Okay, so the economic development activities that have potential wildlife impacts. Talking about offshore energy production and not just oil and gas extraction, like I mentioned, possibly interactions with wind, possibly interactions with tidal energy, <coughs> beach nourishment and dredging, recreation, road construction, housing, and harvest. And when I say harvest, I mean the commercial harvest. Think about things like fishing. Okay, so what are possible responses to conflict? You can pick a winner. And when uh, folks tend to pick winners, they, they look for the almighty J word, and I don't mean Jacksonville. <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean jobs. And when I say that, that winner tends to be short-term economic gain, except when it finally becomes something that, that is not sustainable. And I, what I'm going to posit to you today is, if you don't start planning for wildlife on the front end, you're not going to be able to have short-term term economic development later because you're going to have endangered species that absolutely prohibit economic development in certain areas. So if you don't set aside habitat for them now, you're going to have to eventually. Um, the second option is to mitigate conflict. The problem is mitigation is imperfect. Um, and usually the environment tends to be on the losing side of mitigation efforts. And the last option is to avoid. And that's the one I'm going to focus on the most today. So the picture I've got below, you see the America's Everglades, the River of Grass, running primarily on the west side of that photo. You've got the Big Cypress National Preserve, Everglades National Park, and then just to the east of Everglades National Park, you see all of this development. And that is Greater Miami-Dade County, um, and there's sort of this line, right? Well, so that line is called the Urban Development Boundary, the UDB. And you can imagine that there are knockdown, drag out fights about moving this urban development boundary further into the Everglades. However, because Miami-Dade County had foresight in creating an urban development boundary, at least we have the conversation and the planning to be able to decide where are we going to set aside for wildlife and where are we going to focus on economic development. And then just to the east of Miami-Dade County, you see Biscayne Bay National Park. Okay, so 
How do you avoid conflict, that third bullet? I'm going to posit today that you avoid conflict with consistency determinations. I spoke quickly about the urban development boundary. That's one way to plan for wildlife. I'm going to talk about the Coastal Zone Management Act, and I'm going to talk about the Gulf of Mexico Energy and Security Act. So this photo is oil and water, and notice they are not mixing. The Gulf of Mexico Energy and Security Act was passed in 2006, and basically it has some primary pieces to it. First of all, Senator Nelson and Senator Val Martinez worked in a bipartisan way with the other Gulf Coast state senators so that each got something. The four oil and gas producing states of Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana get a portion of federal revenues from offshore oil and gas leasing on the Outer Continental Shelf starting in 2017. In return for that extra drilling and revenue from the central and eastern Gulf of Mexico, or South Central and Western Gulf of Mexico, the eastern Gulf of Mexico is off limits from a congressional and statutory moratorium until 2022. So that means that if you go to, um, oh, I'm going to get to this later, guys. I'm way ahead of my presentation. So Gulf of Mexico Energy and Security Act is another option for consistency. Okay, so the Coastal Zone Management Act. This was passed in 1972 and it's implemented by the NOAA Office of Ocean and Coastal Resource Management. This is a voluntary program for, all, for, for states that have coasts. There's 35 eligible states and they all participate. And when I say coast and I say 35 states, you're going, what? Also, um, the Great Lakes qualify. So it requires a consistency determination for federal actions that have reasonably foreseeable effects on any land or water use or natural resource of the coastal zone. This is unique, okay, because the federal consistency re requires consistency not only with the environmental effects of a federal action, but also with the effects on coastal uses. So things like shipping, recreation, fishing, those are also required to be consistent with a state's coastal management plan. So the consequences of a failure to plan. We've seen this picture before. This is the Deepwater Horizon oil rig. On April 20th of 2010, I was uh, going to work in Senator Nelson's office three weeks after having been told by the Minerals Management Service that we could actually drill closer to the state of Florida than in the congressional moratorium. So the moratorium I talked about basically said that the military mission line, which is at 86 degrees and 41 minutes west longitude, straight down from, from South Florida is the boundary. You cannot drill east of it. So in some places, because that goes straight down, the peninsula of Florida head sort of juts out east, easterly. Um, in some places, that's 250 miles off the coast of Florida. However, starting in March of 2010, the Mineral Man Minerals Management Service and the Department of the Interior were starting to, to try and press the senators from Florida to allow that line to change and instead we go to 175 miles off the coast. And to try and convince them to do this, they showed us modeling of the loop current and told, assured us at the time that if you had a spill and it was over 175 miles away from the coast of Florida, there would be enough time for the agencies, to, the Coast Guard and the agencies to respond to stop that oil within a few days before it got entrained in the loop current. So what would have happened if it got in the loop current? Well, you guys would have been worried about the Deepwater Horizon oil spill at that point because the loop current loops around in the Gulf of Mexico, comes down through the Florida Straits between Florida and Cuba, and comes up the eastern seaboard. And it just starts to go offshore right near Jacksonville. So um, Donald Rumsfeld and Secretary Gates both said that oil and gas drilling in the eastern Gulf of Mexico were inconsistent with military testing and training. That's why the military mission line was established as the boundary of the oil and gas drilling moratorium. So that's why I say that consistency is a really big problem because three weeks after the Minerals Management Service was trying to convince us that it was safe to drill even closer to Florida, an oil rig off the coast of Louisiana exploded and it took them 87 days to cap that one. So you remember this. Here's a picture of Louisiana and where the location of the Deepwater Horizon oil rig. You see that Florida is quite far away from that every morning during the oil disaster, we would get these uh, maps from NOAA telling us where the most likely oiling areas would be. Um, and we just prayed that the model that's on the bottom right wasn't gonna happen. 
and that the oil wasn't going to get in the loop current and come south. But just today, the researchers at the University of South Florida released information that oil made it all the way down towards Sarasota and Sanibel Island, and it has been found in fish livers. Okay, so is this good for the economy? <coughs> Certainly not good for the wildlife. This is really blurry, it's not your eyes, I know it's late. <laughs> You're not the only state that's addressing these issues of how do we have consistency, not only with what we want for our economy and how we want it to be, but also with what do we do about climate change. So the state of Louisiana, after Hurricane Katrina, recognized that a failure to address environmental concerns was truly harming their economy and their safety. And so they put together an, a large planning effort. It's 109 projects, a cost of $50 billion, to be uh, done over 50 years. Because the, Louisiana, the state of Louisiana has lost 1,900 square miles of land since the 1930s. And most of these are coastal wetlands. So when you talk about green infrastructure and risk reduction, wetlands and coastal marshes are excellent features for this. So you've got Gulf of Mexico, you've got bigger storms, you've got huge hurricanes that hit this region all the time. When you're losing this land, you're losing your first line of defense and your least expensive one. So, well, not least expensive anymore, but if you left it naturally, it would have been the least expensive. So the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan takes into account sea level rise, but they assumed 10 to 18 inches. And so you saw from Margo's presentation that it's not really clear. I mean, we're not sure what we're actually gonna face. But the state, state of Louisiana is facing something that Florida isn't, which is that the actual state is sinking. And so they have subsidence in addition to sea level rise. So what did they do? They put together this ambitious $50 billion master plan, but they also put in a consistency requirement. And so there was an executive order that came out just after they started the planning process that directs all state agencies to administer basically everything they do um, in a way that's consistent with the master plan and the public interest to the maximum extent possible. So the consistency guidelines say that to be consistent with the master plan, a project must strive to achieve one or more of the master plan objectives and must not be detrimental or conflict with any projects in the master plan. Sounds great, right? Sounds like this state is really committed to restoration and resilience. Except that, <laughs> just this fall, they started to consider an application for a coastal use permit for, to build a coal terminal on the side of the Mississippi River Banks right where, and this one's also blurry guys, but right in the location of one of the major sediment diversions that's planned in the coastal master plan. And the Louisiana uh, Department of Natural Resources approved this coastal use permit in October 1 of 2013. It's being challenged in court now because of this very determination about what is consistency. So I want you to think back about the Coastal Zone Management Act that I referred to. Um, in the state of Florida, the entire state is within the coastal zone. And so it's a very big hammer against federal actions. You're talking federal money, federal permits. The state of Florida can stop them if they're inconsistent with its Coastal Zone Management Act. But just like in the case of Louisiana, the state is in the driver's seat when it comes to determining what is consistency. Okay, so the Restore Act. This is a interesting little cartoon that came up in one of the Mississippi papers while we were in the midst of trying to pass it. I started working on drafting the Restore Act um, in October of 2010. It took us until July 6th of 2012 to have it on the president's desk for signature. So the Restore Act directs the bulk of civil clean water act fines stemming from the Deepwater Horizon oil disaster back to the Gulf Coast for economic and environmental restoration. Now this seems like such a great idea, right? This region is a resource-based economy and this environmental disaster harmed its, its economy as well as the environment. But it wasn't that easy to get moved forward, and so I thought this was a funny cartoon to share with you that close only counts in horseshoes. So here's the division of funding that will come from the Restore Act. And you can see that a large part of it can be used for both economic restoration and environmental restoration. There is a portion that is dedicated solely to ecosystem restoration. And the portion that allows for economic development has a very interesting and important provision in it. 
And that says that bucket three, the bucket that can be used for economic development, must be consistent with the goals and objectives of the ecosystem restoration plan. So this consistency framework is really important. And particularly so, again, in the Gulf Coast where we have a resource-based economy. So to close out my presentation, um, in the state of Florida, it's up to you to be the leaders of tomorrow and to tell this state what you want the future to look like. And if you don't, the unfortunate thing is the future's going to come anyway particularly in the case of climate change. There are 94.7 million visitors in, two, in 2013 to the state of Florida, which makes it the top travel destination in the world. And for every 85 visitors you get in this state, it's one job. So it's not one or the other, but both and. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thanks. Hello everyone, and thank you to Florida Coastal and Jacksonville University for putting this great environmental summit together and for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, climate change uh, regional planning and uh, promoting that all um, cities, states um, need to adopt um, planning because we need to be proactive instead of reactive. It actually saves um, millions, maybe billions of dollars. Um, and also that in those plans, uh, we need to have meaningful public participation. So really I'm talking about you guys today because you guys are the general public and you are the ones that need to be participating um, in, in these plans along with everyone else involved. Um, so climate change is real, it's unequivocal. We know that it's largely um, induced by human activity. Um, we are experiencing uh, the impacts of climate change now, and those are going to increase um, in the future. Um, the frequency of extreme weather events, rising sea levels that we've talked about today, droughts, floods, fires. But climate change isn't just an environmental problem that affects our weather and our ecosystems. It's a threat to our very existence. We as humans need nature to survive. Nature doesn't need us, and actually we are ruining nature on a regular basis. Um, you can see the list of all of the human systems that are being impacted and will continue to be affected due to climate change. Um, so this, to me, really there's a, a direct link between human rights and, and climate change. And we are going to be experiencing uh, our rights being affected due to climate change. So how do we deal with the climate change? Well, mitigation, um, which is uh, ways and actions to reduce the effects of climate change, um, basically trying to solve the climate change problem, was the focus um, for a very long time. Until we realize that climate change is happening, it's, it's occurring right now, so we not only need to mitigate, but we need to adapt to these effects and con negative consequences that are going to occur. And adaptation is um, measures that are minimizing these, these negative consequences of climate change. Um, and is crucial, really, for reducing um, socioeconomic damage. Climate change plans are necessary. Uh, countries around the world are beginning to develop these, these plans, which include these 
mitigation and adaptation strategies, you know, so reducing greenhouse gases, we learned about, you know, clean energy, um, and also um, implementing adaptation um, plans w w within regions, locally, uh, globally. Um, so soon, every, I, I'm, I say that every major city needs a climate change plan, because Urban centers are extremely vulnerable to extreme weather events and the impacts of climate change because there's a huge concentration of, of people, of wealth, and a huge dependence on, on infrastructure. So soon, I believe that if cities don't have these climate change plans, they're going to be looked upon as negligent in its responsibility to protect its citizens, its economy, and really its quality of life. So what do we need? Um, we need, in these plans, in order for them to be successful, we need to have public awareness and engage stakeholders. And I'll talk about that um, a little bit more um, here shortly. So cost-effective technologies, innovation, science, all of those are great solutions. But we also need societies, you, to be motivated and empowered to adopt those changes. Otherwise, we're not going to have anything meaningful that happens. So sustainable development is really uh, a perfect balance between three pillars. And the, the picture shows the pillars are the economy, the environment, and society. And so I'm going to be focusing more on the society and, and the social um, things that we need to do and specifically focusing on, on participation. So it came to the forefront of uh, the environmental um, concerns in 1992 at the United Nations um, Conference on Environment and Developed in Rio. And through that, the Rio Declaration was developed. Um, sustainable development became the goal of, of the modern economy at this time. And public participation is seen as a fundamental prerequisite for sustainable development. Principle 10 specifically states that environmental issues are best handled with the participation of all concerned citizens. In 2012, they celebrated Rio uh, plus 20, 20 years later, um, and that basically represented a global movement where you not only had government and the private sector, but you had civil society also engaged in the dialogue and participating in order to achieve global prosperity while also protecting the environment. Oops. So what kind of impacts are we going to have here in Florida that we need to adapt to and have and achieve sustainable development? We've talked about sea level rise. We're going to have reduced capacity of flood control structures, saltwater intrusion. I mean, these are all things that you've heard throughout the day today. Landward migration of freshwaters, flooding uh, during high tide, increased flood insurance premiums, amplified storm surge and shoreline erosion and degradation, and worsely, permanent inundation. So Florida is extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. It has the second longest coastline in the US. Three-fourths of the population reside in coastal counties that generate 79% of the state's total economy. That replacement value of those communities totals $2.9 trillion. South Florida sits on porous limestone, which basically think of Swiss cheese. Water moves very easily through there, and your conventional sea walls and barriers aren't going to be effective. Um, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, lists Miami as the number one most vulnerable city worldwide in terms of property damage. We're talking over $400 billion. It's number one. It's it, it, above Bangladesh, <coughs> Indonesia, India, very um, developing countries. And here we are in an industrialized nation, um, the city most vulnerable. 
It also lists it as number nine in terms of population exposed to coastal flooding, over two million people in Miami alone. Um, and the Keys were designated as the area most at risk in the United States due to the impacts of climate change. So we have the Army Corps of Engineers here um, today, and they have the most conservative view, which is the, the, the first one, of uh, what the projected sea level rise is. So they project three to seven inches by 2030, and nine to 24 inches by 2060. However, the worst case scenarios, um, which have been numerous studies, um, University of Miami, University of Arizona, which is the picture um, that I think was uh, shown earlier today, um, that shows you where all of the flooding is, is, is going to occur um, if there's just a, a, a above a two meter rise um, getting into the, 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 the 21st century, or the next century. Um, so what does that mean? If we continue the business as usual model with these worst case scenario projections, 99.6% of Monroe County, which includes the Keys, and 70% of Miami-Dade County are underwater. They're gone. That's homes to 1.5, that's 1.5 million homes. It's two nuclear reactor plants, 68 hospitals, 74 airports, 341 hazardous material cleanup sites. Can you imagine what is going to be in that water if this, if this really does occur? Um, and 19,000 historic structures. Um, I pulled some quick facts on uh, for, for Jacksonville, and that would mean 4% of Jacksonville would be flooded, um, decimating low-lying uh, wetlands. And if there is a Category 5 hurricane, now Katrina was a 4, so if there's a 5, that could be up to $18.3 billion in damages for uh, Jacksonville alone. So. If you have just six inches of sea level rise, which is what the Army Corps projects, most conservative, you're gonna have an increase in saltwater intrusion, which would require adaptation strategies, including trying to find alternate sources of water and desalination. The rise of flood insurance premiums could lead to a decline in property values. Um, the Florida Keynoter states that um, due to recent congressional legislation, um, flood insurance premiums could increase from $2,500 to $30,000 for ground level homes in the Keys. Um, attorneys are also um, advocating for legislation where you would have a warning clause such as a lead paint in contracts because they think that property sellers could be sued if they don't disclose a sea level rise. So Southeast Florida um, came together, the Keys, Broward, uh, Miami-Dade, and Palm Beach um, came together and created the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact, which represents a joint commitment to collaborate on a regional plan to mitigate the causes and adapt to the consequences of climate change. The compact calls for counties to work cooperatively to develop annual legislation, legislative programs jointly advocate for state and federal policies, dedicate staff, time, and resources to create the Regional Climate Action Plan, which is my next slide, and to meet annually um, in regional climate summits. The, the plan um, focuses on six categories. Those categories include sustainable communities, uh, transportation planning, water supply management, infrastructure, natural systems, energy and fuel, and what I'm going to talk about right now is outreach and public policy. Because Southeast Florida recognizes that you, the best planning efforts will not be implemented or reach the full potential without the support of the public. Of the public. We have to build awareness by providing access to information. We have to engage all stakeholders specifically the communities most affected by the environmental threats. Have regular meetings, work, workshops, opportunity for meaningful dialogue and effective participation in the decision-making process. 
So here's a list of all the stakeholders, um, and I'm sure there's, there's, there's many more. Um, and I want to applaud the youth because I actually include them. The youth think outside the box and they can create solutions that we are just way too domesticated to ever think of. So that's why I propose that the youth should be important stakeholders um, in, in this as well. Um, and especially the communities affected, um, again. Um, public outreach, you need to have um, materials and events to increase public awareness. And I'm not talking about hundreds of pages of material. Keep it short and concise. Um, we have a very short attention span nowadays. Um, we need to educate on ways that we can lessen our carbon footprint. Have visual communication, dedicate websites and have document repositories, social media, hello, it's free. Uh, workshops, conferences, public meetings. Um, also in relaying uh, the information, we have to communicate it actively, um, consistently, and through different means of, of communication. Make it personal. Americans um, feel a disconnect uh, with climate change. How is it going to affect them? Why should they care? Um, we talked about today, knowing your audience, you know, that is going to determine the content of the information, as Professor Hall was saying, um, the messaging, you know, make sure you have that appropriate language, um, make it concise and relevant, um, have that sense of urgency, uh, make it reliable and credible, and really empower the community to make a difference. Um, so sure, there are challenges with meaningful participation. I mean, climate change is not imminent. It's hard to communicate something that's not going to unfold for, um, for many years. Um, be careful with your sense of urgency because fear can cause chaos. So you have to have that fine line. Also, it's not a top priority for Americans. I know my time is up, so I'm going to um, go a little bit faster than I'm going now. Um, so the, the priorities are more, how am I going to put food on the table? What is my housing? So climate change is definitely not on the top of the list. There are economic risks involved. Imagine you tell all the people in the Keys, oh, your insurance premiums are going to be 30000 They're all going to run, sell the homes, and you know, that has a big impact. Um, there's, people still don't believe in climate change, you know, so, so we need to get rid of that skepticism. Um, there's delays when you have competing interests. The community's priorities are not necessarily the same as the municipalities, so that could cause delays in the whole process. Um, so there are many benefits um, to meaningful participation, um, including environmental equity and sustainable development, um, motivating participants to change their energy consumption and reduce their carbon footprints, um, the truth is, is that we need to work on this together, and it's not going to get done by just, you know, heads of government and, and politicians. We, the public, need to make a difference. Um, so I, I promote climate change plans and also meaningful public participation and outreach in those plans because this is the only way to achieve a higher quality of life for present and future generations. I'm going to leave you with a quote from an Indian proverb, which states that we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. So we have an obligation and a duty to protect it. Thank you. change today. Most of us have focused on sea level rise and the impact on infrastructure. But I'm wondering um, how many and to what how many people have looked at and to what extent they've looked at um, the potential for a temperature increase and then the resulting um, adaptation of movement by plants and animals um, throughout Florida and, and whether they can adapt to that kind of um, that kind of change. Yeah so I can go ahead and take a stab at that. So one, one dynamic angle that I am particularly focused on in terms of wildlife and climate change in the state of Florida is the migration of exotic invasive species. We already have a climate that is 
well suited um, because it's temperate towards a lot of exotic invasive species that harm our native wildlife. And we're going to see that increase as we have a, a much more warming climate. And sort of the, the token charismatic, well, anti-charismatic megafauna that you think of when you think of exotic invasive species in Florida is the Burmese python in the Everglades. And there are models from the USGS risk assessment of the Burmese python establishment that shows them being, go, being able to survive a winter all the way up towards where I live in Washington, D.C. So, you know, we've got to think not only when we talk about climate change about the fact that it's going to fragment and degrade habitat for our native wildlife, but it's also going to increase threats on them from exotic invasives. So that's, you know, one angle that sometimes gets lost in the conversation about how climate change is going to impact our wildlife. Sarah, I have a question. And you were talking earlier, you sort of uh, set the premise a little bit that the Endangered Species Act was somewhat sacrosanct, um, and yet that could be changed by Congress in uh, one fell swoop, which there is a movement of what to do that. Absolutely. Um, what's your prognostication of that happening? Well, if I had one of the divining rods that we saw in the earlier presentation, <laughs> I might actually have a better chance, you know, with one of those. You know, so here's the, here's the kind of quirky thing about the Endangered Species Act, right? Of all of the federal environmental laws, the great thing about the ESA is it is a strong hammer. If you have an endangered species and you have a Jeopardy opinion, <coughs> the activity cannot take place. However, that said, I just saw um, an article that the Kensridley sea turtle is an endangered species, and I think there were 42,000 incidental takes last year that were by permit. So I do think that the Endangered Species Act, at, when we start having more conflicts, which we already do, between endangered species and economic development, you're going to see a louder drumbeat of folks wanting to dismantle it in Congress. You see this with the lesser prairie chicken, you see this with the sage grouse, and the other angle that I want to throw in there is that with climate change, you're going to have more endangerment, less habitat, therefore more critical habitat, and you're going to get a lot of those conflicts. Now, just before the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, actually just before the Gulf of Mexico Energy and Security Act, there was a drumbeat of drill, baby, drill. And everybody thought that Senator Nelson and Senator Martinez's congressional moratorium was going to be reversed. Um, sometimes nature has a funny way of showing us that she's more in charge than we think we are. Anybody else? We've got time for a couple more. I mentioned earlier that I saw an article in Science this week about this core of mud from the, off the tip of Greenland. And it, it showed that the, what I call the global conveyor in the Gulf Stream, or what scientists call the global conveyor, had shut down three times in a period of roughly something about 70,000 years. But each time it shut down, that meant that it shut down for two or three hundred years. Hmm. And if you have the global circulation of the ocean stopped. What we're doing now, we have massive changes in rainfall distribution all over the planet. But just at the very end of the article, I said also, and by the way, one of the things that nobody has accounted for in any of the, environment, uh, the sea level rise studies is that if the just the rate of flow of the intensity of this of this conveyor slows down, sea level will rise. Uh, along the East Coast of the United States, because the water will still flow north, but it won't flow south as quickly, and it'll kind of like pool because of the Coriolis effect. Now, all this is really <coughs> cutting edge, you know, physical oceanography, and it's tough to turn it into public policy. But I, I guess my point of, of emphasizing it is that some of this stuff is not going to be a linear, gradual kind of thing, and then, but it's also not going to be a, it could be a Hurricane Sandy in one location, but it could also be a very broadly based, but very rapid, and like, kind of like a tsunami that hit the whole coast of Japan for hundreds of miles. And, and it just doesn't, you know, people think linear, we don't think on them. And the past is no indication of the future works in, in investing, but in terms of planning, I, you know, your challenge as a planner is how do you prepare people for catastrophes that 
you can't even explain to them because the physics are so complicated. Well, the I'll, odds I'll, are so low, but I, they're real. I'll, I'll give that a shot. I, I think we so far have made a kind of calculation that it's better to just get started. Um, in that, I, my, my guess is that kind of a conversation and that discussion of science might be better received in South Florida because the conversation's been going on for some time and they're seeing um, impacts more quickly than Northeast Florida. Um, I, I think we've been, and this may ultimately you know, turn out to not have been the best, cho the best choice, but um, we have been trying to not talk about causes, not really talk about the science much at all. Um, be very sort of upfront about saying, you know, we made these assumptions, um, we didn't do any modeling specific to our area, but it's better to have a plan than not to have a plan, so we want to get the dialogue started and start from there. And that's kind of where we are, is just getting started. Now, the, cata the catastrophe, the Hurricane Sandy, I realize could happen tomorrow. Um, and if it does, we won't have a plan. Um, but I, I guess we're, we're, we're trying to at least get a groundswell of public acceptance so that we can have a more robust discussion. I know it's not really a good answer to your question. So there's a couple of pieces on that. First of all, you're preaching to the preacher. But second of all, you know, so, and I'm using all these cliches, right? Success breeds success. So I think that Margot's point is, if you can get stepwise, then you can go from there. And so even if you aren't able to agree on, the, you know, on things that are pretty much not in dispute in the scientific community, that shouldn't stop you from progress. And if you're able to get a reinsurer, for example, to come in and say that when I evaluate your all-state insurance policy and whether or not I'm going to reinsure it, I'm going to look to sea level rise, I'm going to look to climate change. And you have someone say that to a homeowner that's about to purchase a 20-year mortgage, all of a sudden it starts to become more real. And it doesn't really matter what the cause is, but they're starting to look for, okay, well, how do I address it? The other dynamic that I think is helpful in messaging is to find people that are on the ground and they actually see the impacts and they're unlikely messengers of those impacts. So one example is there is a um, fisherman in the Gulf of Mexico who is a commercial fisherman. He holds permits for Red Snapper. His family has been fishermen for their whole lives. And he went to the Senate Commerce Committee to testify on ocean acidification. When I say ocean acidification, I don't mean ocean acidification. I mean, the ocean is basic, but it's really weird if I said ocean less basic. <laughs> okay, so it's becoming less basic, um, but we're not actually having an acidic ocean. But you're already starting to see impacts in the shellfish species. And so because this gentleman has been on the water his entire life, has never taken a class on physics, I can guarantee you. But for him to go and talk to the Senate committee and talk about it, Senate Oceans Committee and talk about ocean acidification was a very powerful message. So those are the kind of tools that you can use when messaging these types of things. Yeah, and I will just say um, that part of climate change is these extreme um, you know, weather events. So regardless of the causes, the effects are still the same. So maybe not have, if you don't have a climate change plan, you, the uh, cities need to also have um, disaster and emergency type of plans. And that those plans need to be communicated to the public. So that way the public knows what to do when disaster strikes. So you have less chaos and less money uh, that, that, that is spent. So the, I believe that there should be um, different plans in place which do need to be communicated to the general public. One of the reasons I'm here is because we need lawyers to engage in support of these different strategies. And I'm hoping that we've inspired some of the students here to consider in their life ahead of them to uh, engage as a community board member to support folks that are out in the community engaged in political affairs or litigation or uh, fostering uh, attention in different ways to uh, finding the pathway for mitigation and 
adaptation uh, that's a little more respectful of the whole range of all the issues, including all the externalities. Basically, climate change is an externality to 150 years romp through fossil fuel combustion. And we, our economy has benefited a lot from that. But uh, I, I just really urge the legal community to help because people like the Wildlife Federation or the Earth Web Foundation or the Sierra Club need legal help to get the voices heard. Amen. Yes. At the Federation, um, so we're Ranger Rick, not the panda. But we have you guys when you're in the Ranger Rick phase, and then we lose you. And you come back to the environmental community, you come back to the Federation when you're childbearing age. So there is this gap, and it's a brain trust that we need participating in the community. And so I'm very hopeful that not only the law students, but folks from JU and folks from the Science and Math Institute are prepared to get involved because we need you the whole way through. Any of our students from Math and Science Institute have any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.